This part of the test will measure your listening ability when it comes to the conversations and lectures in academic settings. You will listen to a recording and then answer questions about it. You will be able to take notes while listening and you can listen to the recording only once. The questions must be answered in the presented order. During the exam, you will not be allowed to go back to the previous question. The questions will be about the main idea and the supporting details. Some questions will be about the speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speaker. Sometimes you will see this icon. It means that you will have to listen to a certain segment of the recording and answer a question about it. Now listen to the lecture. Extremophiles are the starting point for the study of astrobiology on our own planet. These are creatures that survive in what would seem to be harsh environments. Life appears to have an amazing capacity for adaption and survival in some of the most extreme environments, whether it is in the deep ocean thermal vents or the acidic rivers of Rio Tento in Spain. This extraordinary adaptability raises the possibility that life may exist in environments we have not yet thought of. We then investigate the fascinating worlds within our own solar system. For example, Mars offers the intriguing potential of past microbial life due to its arid riverbeds and indications of old lakes. Similar to Earth, moons like Europa and Enceladus may contain life as we know it, or perhaps undiscovered forms due to their possible subterranean oceans. The possibility of exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars, outside of our solar system, complicates our quest in yet another way. Astrobiology has entered uncharted territory with the discovery of exoplanets in the habitable zone, where conditions may allow for liquid water. In the big picture, finding other creatures is only one aspect of the quest for extraterrestrial life. It involves comprehending the true meaning of existence. What gives an object life? Alternative biochemistries to those we are familiar with on Earth might exist. These inquiries cast doubt on how we define life itself. Despite this, astrobiology has significant limitations. Even though scientists have uncovered extreme forms of life on Earth and in promising places in the solar system and beyond, we haven't yet found proof of extraterrestrial life. Direct exploration is also faced with several challenges due to the distances involved in space exploration. What is the main idea of the lecture? Which of the following is not mentioned as a location where life might exist outside Earth? How does the professor feel when discussing the limitations of astrobiology? What does the professor imply when saying? 
This extraordinary adaptability raises the possibility that life may exist in environments we have not yet thought of. What is the primary goal of astrobiology as discussed in the lecture? Which of the following is mentioned as part of astrobiology, and which is not? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Good day. I'm trying to gather information on the university's procedures concerning the utilization of library facilities, specifically during the period of final exams. Certainly. The library provides services 24 hours a day during the final examination week. You're allowed to use all the resources as you normally do, but we insist on a strict, quiet environment. So, what happens when I need to engage in an intellectual discussion with my study circle? That's a good point. For such situations, you're required to book one of our study rooms. You can make this booking online or directly at the library's customer service desk. How about the usage of electronic gadgets like laptops or tablets? You're allowed to use such devices as long as they're not creating any disturbance to others. But for phone calls, you need to step out of the library. I see. And is it allowed for students to bring their own food and beverages into the library? While we generally advise against bringing food due to potential spillage or mess, you are allowed to bring small snacks and drinks in sealed containers. We just ask that you're considerate of the other users. Makes sense. Can I know more about the process of borrowing books during the finals? Of course. The book borrowing process remains the same even during finals. However, due to a higher demand for books during this period, we request that you to return them as soon as you finish reading. Got it. Are there any repercussions for not returning the books on time? Yes. Late returns do carry penalties. And you should note that during finals week, these penalties are stricter than usual. We recommend avoiding such situations. I'll bear that in mind. Thanks for the clarification. You're welcome. Do remember to respect the library's policies and maintain a conducive environment for everyone. We're here to assist you in any way we can during this crucial period. What is the central theme of the dialogue? What can be interpreted about the administrator's standpoint on having food in the library?
What is the process for the student to reserve a study room in the library? What is the student's reaction to the consequences for late return of books? Based on the dialogue, what is the administrator's attitude towards the use of electronic gadgets in the library? Now listen to the lecture. Food supply and ideal breeding conditions are the main factors that influence bird migration. These aren't the only elements affecting such complex behavior, though. Other factors that are known to be important include weather patterns, the location of the sun, and magnetic fields. There are two main migratory trends that we see in Europe. Many bird species travel thousands of kilometers across continents, such as the Arctic tern, from their breeding grounds in the north to their winter homes in the south. Others, such as the European robin, only exhibit partial migration, with some individuals remaining in one place all year long, while others migrate only in part of their population. The swallow, which migrates across great distances from Europe to Africa in the winter, is a well-known example of long-distance migration. These birds are very tough, enduring many challenges like bad weather and predators. How these organisms, who are so little, can endure such a difficult voyage year after year is absolutely amazing. This, in my opinion, is evidence of the unbreakable spirit of life. The significance of stopover locations should not be disregarded when discussing bird migration. Birds don't make their entire journey in one sitting. They make rest and refueling stops at particular locations. It's an intriguing idea given the migrating birds depend on these resting places, which are frequently wetlands or coastal regions to survive. Understanding bird migration goes beyond the classroom. It has significant ramifications for conservation initiatives. Bird populations are on the decline as migratory routes and stopover places are impacted by habitat loss brought on by climate change or human activity. It's our duty, as Earth stewards, to see to it that these species and their habitats are safeguarded. Now, one might be curious as to how birds migrate. It is a subject of ongoing research. There is some evidence to support the claims that birds can detect the Earth's magnetic field, make use of the sun and stars' positions, and even rely on smell and optical signals. They basically have a GPS built in, which is quite amazing. What is the main idea of the lecture? How does the professor feel about the journey of the swallow?
What does the professor imply when he says? It is our duty as Earth stewards to see to it that these species and their habitats are safeguarded. Why does the professor mention the concept of stop oversights? What did the professor mean when he said? This, in my opinion, is evidence of the unbreakable spirit of life. Which of the following are mentioned as factors influencing bird migration? Now listen to the conversation between two people. Professor, I seem to be struggling a lot with public speaking and presentations. Can you advise me on how to improve? Of course, one critical aspect is preparation. Knowing your material inside and out builds confidence. I do prepare, but I get nervous and forget everything. Then practice is key. Rehearse until your presentation becomes second nature. You can also try techniques to manage anxiety. Techniques like what? Like breathing exercises, visualization, or even speaking in front of a mirror. Have you considered joining a public speaking club? That sounds intimidating. I'm not sure I can handle it. I understand, but remember, stepping outside your comfort zone is often the path to growth. Moreover, everyone there is learning just like you. I see. What about my voice? It seems monotonous and dull. You might want to work on your vocal variety. Change your pitch, uh, pace, and volume to make your presentation more engaging. I'll keep that in mind. And what about the content? It should be well-structured and clear. Use visual aids if necessary, and remember, less is more. Don't overload your audience with information. What is the main idea of the dialogue? What does the professor imply when he suggests the student to join a public speaking club?
How does the student feel about joining a public speaking club? What is the professor's attitude when the student expresses fear about joining a public speaking club? What does the professor suggest about the content of the presentation? Now listen to the lecture. Let's start with the magnetic field of the sun, the solar dynamo, a process that transforms kinetic energy from the sun's differential spin into magnetic energy, creates this intricate dynamic system. The magnetic field is bent and sheared as a result of this differential rotation, which sees the equator rotate more quickly than the poles. The solar cycle is an 11-year cycle that governs how the magnetic field of the sun changes. The north and south magnetic poles alternate positions as the sun's magnetic field slowly flips over this cycle. Numerous solar activities such as solar flares and coronal mass ejections are based on this cyclical phenomenon. The release of magnetic energy causes solar flares which are powerful bursts of radiation and other particles to occur, they are essentially dynamic electromagnetic manifestations of the sun's personality. These flares can have a significant impact, causing everything from stunning auroras to destructive geomagnetic storms. On the other hand, coronal mass ejections, or CMEs, are enormous clouds of solar plasma that are blasted into space as a result of magnetic changes. A CME is comparable to the sun yelling out to the universe to make its electromagnetic existence known. If these phenomena meet with Earth's magnetosphere, geomagnetic storms may result, potentially seriously disrupting our technological infrastructure. Now let's focus on solar neutrinos, a lesser-known phenomenon. These are elusive particles created by nuclear fusion in the sun's core. They do not directly interact with the magnetic field of the sun and have very weak interactions with matter. However, research into solar neutrinos can reveal vital details about the fusion process and the dynamics of the sun. In contrast, the magnetic field of the sun has a significant impact on the solar winds, streams of charged particles that emanate from the sun. They create the interplanetary magnetic field, which is the extension of the sun's magnetic field into outer space. Let's talk briefly about the helioseismology, which examines the sun's innards using its oscillations. The magnetic field of the sun affects these oscillations, which gives researchers a window into the sun's inner workings. This is an illustration of how the magnetism of the sun can affect a non-electromagnetic phenomenon. What is the main idea of the lecture?
According to the lecture, what does a CME signify? How does the professor feel about the sun's electromagnetism? What did the professor imply when discussing solar neutrinos? Why does the professor mention helioseismology in relation to the sun's magnetism? Which of the following are influenced by the sun's magnetic field, and which are not, as per the professor's lecture? <laughs> 